He, the Celtics have not in the last five, six years, they haven't had a guy like this who can stretch the floor. You're going to have to work hard on both ends against mm-hmm. Porzingis. And I think he's been a very, I, w- I don't want to say a surprise, but I think we found out he's, he's an, actually a, an above average defender. Um, and he, he does present matchup problems on the defensive end, but offensively, the way he stretches the floor, they haven't had that piece. Whereas I'm talking more about the opponent now. The opponent has to actually work really hard now to come out and guard a big that can shoot. Celtics Beat is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another edition of Celtics Beat. It is the last one of the regular season, which means the next time we join you, and actually I don't think I'll be part of it. I think it's going to be Evan, whoever he is with. Evan Valenti is here. I am Adam Kaufman. I'll be on vacation, so I won't be around for the round one preview, whoever it is the Celtics wind up getting, and we honestly don't know yet with the jockeying proceeding that is happening in the Eastern Conference. We'll touch on that a a little bit later on, but Celtics are incredible. We know that. They're just dicking around at the end of the regular season at this point in time they're 62 and 17 three games left all at home against the knicks the hornets and wizards it's just a big bucket of suck and so none of, we're not going to spend a ton of time obviously we're not going to like preview these games that are coming up thursday friday and sunday respectively it just doesn't matter i mean nothing that happens right now barring obviously injury matters as it relates to the end of the regular season and that was never made more clear than by that game uh just what as we sit here a little less than a week ago against sacramento when (laughs) joe missoula refused to put the starters in for much of if not the entire fourth quarter as a lead was you know double digit lead was dwindling 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 with the reserves and i mean like next level reserves like bottom of the bench i may as well have been out there level reserves going up against the king's starters because they had something to play for and it took xavier tillman to hit a game winner with seven seconds left to win that game and after the game missoula called it practice so that is where we're at that is where we're at at the end of the regular season which honestly is a wonderful place to be that's what you want get the guys in get them their reps as much as they want them and as much as you know the the team experts on load management and yada 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 decide is necessary but a seize with a 14 game lead in the eastern conference it is obscene i mean this is like old school yankees leading everybody else in in the al east in the 90s by double figures kind of situation right now late in the regular season but there is you know potential injury stuff to talk about as it relates to other teams most notably the team that is quote-unquote right behind the Boston Celtics the Milwaukee Bucks Giannis Antetokounmpo who was out for the remainder of the regular season with this left calf injury and may not be ready for the playoffs once again we think about last year when they went down in the opening round when they were injury depleted obviously and uh, upset by the Miami Heat who as is often the case, became a postseason nightmare for the Boston Celtics. So a lot of stuff, obviously, to get into. But as you heard in the intro, as you can see on your cameras, if you're watching on the CLNS YouTube page, we have a guy we haven't had on here in a little while and thrilled to welcome him back, my friend and yours, Brendan Glasheen, who, as I said, is the voice of the main Celtics, who you want to talk about games that are meaningless for the big club? Not the case in the G League right now. The main C's, no longer the Red Claws, rest in peace. The main C's are one win away from winning a championship. We talk about Banner 18 in Boston. They're going for Banner 1 in Maine. And this is an exciting time, obviously. And, uh, you know, uh, if this were the Lakers, they'd probably count that toward their original titles. But the Boston Celtics aren't going to do that. They, I don't think you'll see a Maine Celtics banner coming up at the TD Garden. But Glash... You took game one, not you, but you were part of it, as far as I'm concerned, over the Oklahoma City Blue, 106 to 86, an utter domination. And of course, game two coming up Thursday night in OKC. It's a best of three series. You guys can put it away now. Congrats in advance for when this team wins the title. I'm very excited for you. How are you? Welcome to the show. First of all, you've done almost 600 of these. That's incredible. Uh, first well, of all, not, not personally. When did we take over, Ev? Like so around 300? We did this math a long time ago, and I don't remember exactly oh. the numbers. So Maybe we've been around for more than half. More than half. Yeah. Either way, yeah, it's been, we, we've been at this for a while. Yeah. It's been so be like, it'd be like the main Red Claws did the first half, and then the main Celtics came in and did the, uh, the back yeah, half. Similar. 
you know, something like that. But uh, thanks for thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, Maine Maine is uh, in a spot here where they can win their first ever championship. They've never been to a finals before. I was looking this up the other day. The last time an NBA franchise and its G League slash D League affiliate won the championship in the same year was the 14-15 Golden State Warriors. And that Warriors team went 65 and 17. So the Celtics are right in that boat. They're not going to get to that 65 win total, but they're going to be right there. Well, they can if they sweep the rest of the way. Can they? Is that right? Well, they have, that's right. They have 17 losses, so they could get there. Uh, okay. War, my bad. Warriors went 67 and, uh, and 15. 67 oh, and 15. Yeah, not going to get there. Um, but that year, Golden State had a double digit lead for first place. I think Houston with Chris Paul and James Harden was the next best team in the Western Conference that year. And uh, yeah, Santa Cruz ended up winning the, the D League title. So I was looking that up because based on where Boston is and where Maine is at at this stage, it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun to follow uh, this team and having been with the team now the last couple of years and seeing some guys that were in Maine that are now impacting Boston's winning. The, the parallels in terms of how they play are very similar and it, it's not just blowing smoke. They they really take it seriously from the how to get guys ready in a Boston like system and, and try to get guys to play for the Boston Celtics. And that's what's happened here the last uh, couple of years. Before we even touch on that and talking about some of the players, and of course there's you know Celtics draft picks in there that people are familiar with, J.D. Davis and Jordan Walsh, among other guys. Something Evan and I were talking about just before the show started, and we haven't been there to personally experience it, but looking at it from afar, and obviously you've done a, a umpteen TV and even now in the playoffs some radio games for this team, but you're in the arena, you're in the atmosphere. It looks, and obviously it's a smaller gym, it's not like the TD Garden or something like that, but it looks like, an absolutely insane, incredible environment. They get like 3,000 people a night. So my first year was after the pandemic was still kind of going on. So they were easing fans back in the building. I'll never forget when the, the first year, the, the main Celtics had Theo Pinson on the roster. They had Jay Sean Page, Luke Cornette. Cornette was actually nabbed for like a 10-day. I want to say it was with Cleveland these 10 day hardship contracts and and cough. I know you know about this kind of stuff. Cause when you're playing NBA DFS, trying to manage your, your lineups, that there must be a whole, uh, a whole brain fart in terms of trying to figure out what the heck's going on with that. But that was what yeah. we were do dealing with. So there would be guys coming off the plane, taking a shuttle or a bus to play. And we'd find out an hour before tip. Yeah. We got a guy coming in. So that's like the minor league background of what the G league does. And you got to have eight guys to play. Um, but now with full full packed houses, they've been selling out these games. They they sold out the entire New Year's slate. Uh, we had twenty six hundred people at the playoff game on Tuesday night. It was absolutely it was a it was so jam packed. You it, you had you felt some of the chants you would hear at an NBA game. The Let's Go Celtics. There was a wave. Maine was up twenty eight in the first half. They had a there was a wave. In the first half, the fans did a wave. Um, there was a bunch of NBA and G League personnel there from the league coming in because it's the finals. But um, yeah, they jam pack. It reminds me a lot for those of you that like to watch the AAU circuit and high school basketball. It has like a peach jam feel to it. You pack the place for the next big star. And of course, in this case, these guys are pros. Um, but it's been fantastic. And the fans are really nice. And now that we're doing radio, we have fans sitting right on top of us. It's got like a camera and indoor feel to it. So been really cool and uh, i know folks might think maine they think you know college hockey or it's more of a hockey region oh they, they like their basketball they really do well yeah cooper flag obviously flag Scared played January. a game at the expo in january yeah, yeah and the there. some of the ticket prices to go watch cooper flag i think we played on a thursday and then maine was off until so it was like a thursday saturday series the g league does a lot of series kind of things with teams just to Save on travel and whatnot. And uh, we played Thursday, Saturday. Cooper Flag had a game at the Expo on Friday. And ticket prices were in the $80 to $100 range to go watch him play. Then he would play down the street downtown at the Cross Insurance Center. Um, but, yeah, exactly to your point. I mean, that's – it's it's one of the oldest buildings in the country, uh, the Portland Expo. And they do track and field events. They do a bunch of high school basketball. The Cooper Flag thing is is the next level of high school basketball. But – yeah, they uh, they do a good job. They they really do. And I, I don't remember her name. You guys might know. I don't know for sure. But the woman who does the Celtics in arena hosting, 
she's come in and done a couple of our games. She'll do like a dual host. So they they in, they integrate some of the the Boston stuff uh, with the game presentation. They do they do a fantastic job with it. You know, so Lash, what, get us up to ahead. speed a little bit here because a lot of people like myself were only really following how's Jordan Walsh doing and how's sure. JD Davison progressing. And you know, there's a little bit of you know, there's there's some obvious attraction to Kata who just got a, a contract, you know, sure. well deserved, right? When you look at the the G League landscape, where does this team fall in terms of talent? I mean, look, they're in the finals. They just beat their opponent by 20 points in game one. Mm-hmm. The three of us, based on your suggestion, are feeling rather confident about the, the ability for Maine to win this whole thing. And yet, is this a, a shock to you that they're here at this point? They were in ninth place at the end of February, and you guys were just talking about it. Uh, I think Adam was just talking about the East and after Boston between two and nine, it's it's a jumble, right? It's a cluster of teams that could get to two or get to three, and teams are fighting for home court. You got to win your division to secure that you get a higher seed, and you've got Miami and Philadelphia just trying to tread water and get stars back in their lineups and whatnot. Well, the East in the G League was like that all year, one through. 13. So Maine was in ninth place. That, so six teams get in in each conference. Maine was in ninth as of the end of February. They would win two, lose two, win one, lose one. And that's the nature of the biz when Kate is with Boston all year. And then Walsh might join Boston on a road trip. I think there was a trip where they went Miami to Dallas. And Walsh had an assist at the end of the Miami game as one of those TNT games. And then he's from DeSoto, Texas. So they wanted to get him on the road. He saw some family. J.D. might make a trip. Peterson was getting some time at the end of December when they went on the road to play the Clippers. Uh, He's from California, or he played his college basketball in California, I should say, at USC. Um, But, like, taking out the the family ties that they also, Boston might have a need because you're resting a Porzingis, so you need Kata. Or you're without Drew Holiday, so you need an extra guard. J.D.'s going to get the call. So that's the nature of it, right? You're going to just kind of hang around, tread water. But the talent was there. We said all year, if Kata was with this team, like Walsh was, and played 40-plus games, I think they build a pretty considerable lead in the conference. That was not the case. And they went on a huge run. They won 10 of their last 12. They went 9-2 and two in March. They had Kata for half of those games in March. And they've put it all together uh, with Peterson, who was on the uh, Sioux Falls Sky Force, the Miami Heat affiliate, Put two and two together, you play your NBA games in Miami, but maybe to keep the G League team uh, sane, we're going we're gonna, to we're keep you guys in South Dakota uh, to make sure you guys are focused on basketball. So there's no G League team in Miami um, for those guys, but Peterson's been a good story. JD's been with the team for two years. So they only brought two guys back from last year's team in Davison and Tony Snell, who was just, throw him in the mix. He's 32 in the NBA for almost a decade and consummate pro extension of the staff all those cliches but it's true um so we always had the feeling of they put it together and they got home games because of how great their home court is because across the g league there's no home court like maine with you can pack a place with 2500 some of these teams play at nba facilities so when you watch a game i think there was a playoff game last tuesday when indiana played delaware and it's at the pacers home arena and they're showing wide shots on the broadcast i'm like you want you might want to tighten this up because there's there's not many people there but yeah. these these games at the Expo have been fantastic. But no, I mean, look, they're, they're here. And I think some guys, you know, Akade is a great example. Like, you're itching to get an NBA contract. You want to be at the next level. He was in the G League last year in the playoffs. He was the MVP runner-up in the league. But they've instilled this, like, they, they all play for each other. They're sacrificing. It's very similar to what we're seeing in Boston. Of course, at a higher level, these guys make way more money. There are more expectations. But... These guys could have at very at any point could have just said, all right, you know, we're going through the motions. Let's let's wrap this up so we can go to our offseason, get ready for summer league and figure out what's next for me. But they've all kind of they've all done it for each other and they've uh, they've pieced it together to go on this pretty awesome run. Well, that's kind of what I was wondering, you know, and I'm thinking of like the in hockey, you'll have the black aces, you know, the minor league guys that get called up for the playoffs that really, you know, barring significant injury, have no chance of sniffing playing in a playoff game, but they're there for practices and to be extra bodies and participate. Sure. And I'm sure, obviously, some of these guys from Maine, you know, whether it's Kata or Davison or Walsh or some of these guys, you know, they're, they're going to come up. They're going to be the same thing, you know, depth for Boston that, uh, 
you know, hopefully never sees a game, you know, no dis- disrespect. Intended. No, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be there to, to help out. So that in mind, you know, some of these guys, and again, I'm, I'm just thinking about some experiences that I've had working in, in minor league hockey in the past. Some of these guys, you could just really tell it's some years like going out chasing a championship. And, and at that time, the AHL, you know, with you, we're talking about the G league it's it's meaningful it's important you know you you're a competitor you want to win a ring other guys it's like eh i mean that i like get me up to the pros sooner so i can be in that atmosphere and with those guys and getting those you know day checks week checks whatever uh it what's what's the vibe around this group i mean i realize they're only a win away so i i think i probably know the answer to the question even as i ask it but how important does it seem like it really feels to this crew to go out and and, you know, to, to be where they are in the first place and then obviously to finish the job. I think it's helped them quite a bit. So so just to throw a couple more names at you, like J.D. Davison and D.J. Stewart, they started to get to know each other on a pro level back in August when they were in Boston for training camp. So Stewart played for the Sixers summer league team, and then he got picked up by Maine on a G League contract. But Stewart was a training camp invite. So Stewart and Davison go way back. Walsh, of course, was a draft pick, signed to an NBA contract. He was in camp. Tate has been in camp from the beginning to a two-way contract. They got Peterson, as I mentioned, in in December when he was just a standard guy, and then he was on a Miami G League deal, and then Boston gave him a a two-way. These guys have all been part of winning cultures where they've been. Uh, Walsh and Davison were in the NCAA tournament after their one years at their respective schools. Walsh was part of an upset against Kansas in last year's NCAA tournament. Davison was on some really good – Alabama got to the Final Four this year, but Davison was part of that fabric that uh, Nate Oates has created at the college level. Stewart played at Duke, was part of a winning culture there, was in the playoffs in the G League last year. Uh, Peterson was an NCAA tournament player. Brandon Slater – I mean, look at – you guys know this. Look at the Knicks, all those Villanova dudes that are playing NBA minutes. I mean, Brandon Slater was on those Villanova teams. They, he didn't win a title, but he got to a Final Four – They've got winning habits, and I think what should be kept keeping in mind, it's easy because this is a Celtics podcast. <laughs> the Celtics have built such a huge lead in the East that these games in March and April are just tune-up games. Let's see what we have with Tillman and Cornett. Do we have a guy that is fighting for maybe a game's worth of minutes over the course of a seven-game series? Who's going who's gonna to go over who in the on the depth chart? So I say that because um, all eyes, I mean, I think the way these guys have approached it is, well, the big clubs got their crap ball put together. They're fine. They've got a 14 game lead. They're going to be the one seed in the East. And it's pretty close to, but certain they're going to be the number one overall seed, right? Depending on the West and how that shakes out. But all eyes are on the G league for the, for, for this particular team. Stevens was at our game last night. Rich Gotham was at our game last night. Mike Zarin, who is a treat to watch just as a fan. Uh, he gets super into it. Remy Cofield, Jarrell Christian, the GM. These guys are approaching it like not only for the Celtics, but all scouting eyes and folks that help run personnel when these games are on national TV. And I know they're not on ABC or ESPN or a TNT, but they're on ESPN News, ESPNU. Well, as that field shrinks... Most scouts have their eyes on you and you could be the next diamond in the rough. And I'm sure any of these guys would love, I just saw this tonight. The Memphis Grizzlies just used their 50th starting lineup because of all the injuries they've had, including former Celtic Marcus Smart. I was looking at their roster today. Memphis has like eight guys on their team that have played in the G League, but they're NBA players now because they've been granted an opportunity. So I think the way these guys have all come together is let's take back a little bit of what we do individually put it together. And if we win games and we show winning habits, that's going to attract an NBA team to perhaps give us a standard contract or at the very least to bring us in for a camp invite and have a chance to be an impact player. And an impact player can be a guy who's 10th, 11th off an NBA bench. And I think they, and I'm I'm not just saying this, I think they see guys like Hauser and Cornett and what their track was. Hauser was an undrafted five-year college player. Luke Cornett was in Chicago, Boston got him in a trade and, as I mentioned, he was on a hardship 10 day and then he was on a two way with Boston briefly. And then, but do you know, they're playing minutes for an NBA championship caliber team. So the the fabric and the, uh, the culture that Boston has established these last handful of years and how they've utilized their G league has, I think 
motivated these guys. And the, it's true. Like guys like Cato will come back and he says, Hey, I was talking to Luke Cornett and Porzingis and Horford are sending me a text. Congrats on the contract. Like those guys don't have to do that. Like they're happy for a guy like Cato because he's put the work in and they see it on a day in day out basis. And guys like Stewart and Davison, as I mentioned, they're in camp. You know, JD Davison said he was super pumped when they got Drew Holiday because he wanted to pick his brain about defense and how to pick your spots on offense and how to guard multiple positions. And even Walsh having a guy like Tony Snell and the Tatum and Brown guys that he looks up to and he he's 20 years old. So they look up to these guys. And I think when you see the winning at the next level from the parent club, you look at it, it's like they, they appreciate people that take back a little bit and want to win games. Yeah, that was a big part. Coffin, you, you probably experienced maybe some of this, but when I, I was doing play by play for the, the Valley cats, uh, a minor league affiliate of the Astros at, uh, so a hockey, baseball, Not, basketball, minor league. Uh, trio. Yeah, we got the minor leagues wrapped up here. But we, nice. we had um, a, a, a visit from the then GM, Jeff Lunau. And Jeff talked about the value at winning at every level. And they wanted to win the New York Penning League championship. They wanted to win the Sally League championship, the AA championship, the AAA championship, and the World Series. They were serious about developing winning habits from as early as you possibly can. So to the credit that the Celtics have done, they've created, one, a Celtics environment in Maine, right? Guys, the offense is similar. The defense is similar. You know, guys are going to have roles. Like, I think Jordan Walsh talked about this the other day. He's, you know, he's it's tough for him because he's he knows what his role needs to be to get in the NBA club, but his role with Maine is slightly different. He's talked about the balancing act of that. But the thing that you can you can take all the way through with you is winning. And winning at every level. And if you're winning G League games and you do what it takes to win G League games, that translates. And I think it's admirable that they're trying to create this sort of culture, not just within their own locker room, but within mm-hmm. all the locker rooms that embody the Boston Celtics. So that's 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 pretty awesome to hear that stuff. Because as you can look, as much as we all want to sit here and say this core of the Celtics is going to be together forever, we all know that's not the case. We know JD is sitting there waiting for, you know, the Peyton Pritchard trade or, you know, somebody to move yeah, on. Well, oh, Evan, there. Evan, just to use a quick example. I mean, look what look at Derek White and his his ascension as a pro. And Popovich, when he comes to town or Boston's in San Antonio, Pop always has a soft spot for Derek White. But when Derek White was a G League guy, you have Kawhi Leonard and Tim Duncan and Manu Ginobili. Like you're 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 focused on winning a title at that level, but at some point, guys like Derek White, who kind of fly under the radar, are going to fill out a 13-man active roster any given night. So I, guys that guys that appreciate the winning culture at the next level and know it, also when you have a superstar like Jalen Brown, who just got a huge extension, and Tatum's due, and they just gave Porzingis a deal. Well, the, if the money's going to be at the top of the roster, you got to find your Housers, you got to find your Cornets to fill out your roster. Um, at some point down the road. And I think that's kind of the path. And I'll add this too. I mean, look at all the teams that are out of it in the East now, Brooklyn, Toronto, Charlotte, Washington, Detroit. We'll see those affiliates come in. So mm-hmm. uh, Motor City and Capital City and uh, Greensboro and the team in Mississauga that comes down from Toronto. And then you've got Long Island. Like some of these teams that are bad in the NBA, they're just kind of throwing crap against the wall, hoping they can find a two-way that just has some buzz, has some talent, and then they can go, boom, look, we found a guy that can maybe play like a sixth man role at the NBA level. Whereas this team is like, we're they're they're telling Walsh, we want you to be able to come to our team and be Jason Tatum and or Jalen Brown's backup and come in and give us 15 minutes and be a stopper defensively and knock down shots. And that's that's the give and take. Do you want to go to an NBA team that doesn't win games or do you want to be part of a winning culture and then be part of a team that could maybe win it and you're part of it in a rotation piece or just on the NBA roster? Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is so easy to play. I can make my Celtic picks and make my entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals and easy gameplay and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. 
Celtics and NBA fans, you can get in on prize picks in 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. On prize picks this week, I'm selecting Jason Tatum to dish out more than five assists and his teammate Jalen Brown to have more than 22 and a half points. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. So look, obviously, like we all know the names. It's Davison, it's Walsh, it's Kata to a degree. You know, he's not a, a Boston draft pick like the other two. But mm-hmm. as, you know, you're not a scout, but you no. watch these guys on a, I don't on think a regular so. basis, obviously. And and you also have conversations with the coaching staff there pretty regularly. And you've interviewed Brad. And, you know, I, I don't know if anyone's that, ever able to get Zarin on the – on the, on the mic, but you know, there's a collection of influential people and scouts. I'm sure you've uh, had some off the record conversations with as well. Is there anyone, not that the big club is in need of anything right now, as you alluded to that changes, you know, you look at Derek white and, and what he, you know, the hurdles he had to climb, not only to serve a purpose in San Antonio, but he gets traded to Boston, a, a deal that some people did question at the time. And, you know, eventually has to leapfrog Marcus Smart, Malcolm Brogdon, and become the player that he is now today, who's going to sure. get a, a, a nice fat new contract here. So as you look at at that, you know, group that exists in Maine right now, I mean, how do you handicap the chances of, of some of these guys that we talked about getting to the NBA, whether it's Boston or otherwise, getting to the NBA and, and becoming impactful players? Well, again, a lot of that has to do with what the choices are made at the at the NBA level and what it comes down to contracts and all kind of the things we just went through, right? When you have two max. Who, who do you think has the skill to develop? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, well, I think Walsh can serve a role on a winning team. Uh, his three point percentage is up from his one year in college. He can when you say serve a role, like be a rotation guy, be a, re, be a rotation guy, and he can hit. So, his shooting percentage has gone up, and he can defend multiple positions. He's six, seven, he's six. They list him as six, six, but his wingspan makes him he can guard fours, he can guard threes, he can guard the ball. Um, so Walsh, I think, definitely has a future, but he's there's so much raw ability, and he had a windmill dunk last night that I think fans might get a a whiff of and they're like get this guy to boston and i'm like i i get it but he, the, the dude needs games and that speaks to to answer your question cough in a general sense the one and done era of college basketball and the, these guys don't have if you're going to go one and done the, the era of i think the last big one and done that went to the nba and played right away and was a star and even then he still had trouble staying on the floor is zion williamson and uh, a lot of these guys go to teams that aren't very good. Like Cade Cunningham was a big name a couple years ago and the Pistons aren't any good. And Cunningham had to miss, has missed games because of injury or whatever it may be. Um, but the, the G league as a whole has grown from the one and done. And I think the NBA and the Celtics more specifically are trying to really use that as a, as a next step. And they make it about their team. Now, as you said, Davis and Walsh and Kata because of the two ways and Peterson too. I should throw Drew Peterson in there because he's on a two way Walsh on assignment. They're looking at those guys in their, in their uh, diaphragm of, of their, of their program and how they fit their program. Um, DJ Stewart's a guy he's, he's short, he's six, two, but man, that guy competes. He makes big shots uh, off the dribble can play off the ball. Him and Davison have been fun. We call him initials cause he's DJ and then you got JD. So we just call him, we just came up with a dumb nickname, like initials, but DJ Stewart's been a G league guy yeah. uh, off and on as a two way. He's on a G league deal with Maine. He's a guy to me that feels like he wants that chance to be a two way and be part of an organization and someone to take a chance on him. But he comes off the bench as a sixth man and, he, and he's a, he's a sniper. He's a game changer can take it to the basket. Even at his, at his height, it's not as, big as some other talented two ways in the league, but he can shoot it too off the dribble, come off a screen and shoot it. Um, so he's a shifty guard that has a future. I think Peterson's another one where he could be, he, he's got that Hauser body type, six, eight, six, nine, catch and shoot, come off a screen, can guard multiple spots. Joe Wieskamp, who speaking of the Spurs, Wieskamp was a second round pick of the Spurs in 2021 was bouncing around. And then Jarrell Christian went out and, got him and said hey he's a guy that could fit what we do and if he comes in and does what we think what he's asked of him and what we think he's capable of he can also fit into our group as a space 
a, a pace and space guy who can shoot, defend, and Wieskamp's numbers since he's come to Maine have shot up exponentially uh, as a three point shooter. So uh, those are some other guys that are that are uh, part of the deal uh, in Portland. Yeah, yeah I think with, the thing with Wieskamp was I remember when they when he first came out. Sorry, I was hitting my mute button here. My my, my fault on that. Um, but the thing with him was he was like the best shooter of the draft when he came out. Drew Peterson can shoot the hell out of it. I mean. And what Sam Hauser is showing you is that in the, in, and again, I'll, I'll go back, not go all the way back here, but I'll throw Duncan Robinson out. There is another guy yeah. who is like these movement shooters. Like you don't have to be Clay Thompson to get drafted in the, you know, the upper end of the first round and have all this accolades in, in the history of his father, like to be attached to you, for sure. you to get a, get a spot in the NBA. Shooting has never been more important in this, in this league than ever. Like right now, if you can be a movement shooter, uh, there's a spot for you somewhere. And the way the Celtics have embraced the three-point line, it makes these guys like a Wieskamp or a Peterson or like what's really tragic to me is to watch our guy Gary Bird. Uh, Gary, um, what the heck's his last name? It's not, is it Matthews? Or, yeah, Gary Matthews or whatever his name is. They had him in there for a while. Gary uh, Payton? No, 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 no. It's it's a white guy that I can't quite remember his name. Yeah, Matthews. What? It's Matthews. Yeah, it's Matthews. Yeah. Um, you know, they let, they let him get away and he's been, become into a terrific shooter. It's, it's the Max Struess, you know, Struess, you bring him in with Javante Green and they pick Javante who's had a nice career himself. Don't get me wrong, but Max Struess is, is playing for, you know, legit rotation minutes for, uh, not a championship contender, but for a team that's going to play in the playoffs, right? Like those guys without this new avenue of like yeah movement shooting has ever been more reliable, valuable than ever like there's definitely a spot for you so these guys going out competing you know maybe dj stewart's a little too small for this particular type of role but like the other guys like there's there's a spot for you and, and boston's gonna have a spot for you at some point as we talk about the roster getting more expensive like they're gonna find ways to cut corners like sam hauser i keep thinking about this cop and i haven't mentioned this in our group chat at all yet but like I am terrified of the contract that that, that Sam House is going to get when he hits the open market because it's going to be substantial if he keeps shooting like this. He's just an unbelievable shooter. So you're going to have somebody in the wing. Like, do you think these guys these guys must understand that? Like, they look at the Boston Club and say, "Hey, like, there's I'm looking at a version of me who eventually yes. will be here, and I can I can be that guy." So like, all these minutes are super valuable. Let's just look it up. Duncan Robinson got five years, $90 million uh, yeah. from Miami. I mean, that's like a horrific contract, but putting that aside, he got it. Yeah. But the AAV isn't that crazy when you consider some of the other guys that get that right. And he's on a winning well, team. I just mean it, it is for Duncan Robinson, but you okay. know, it, the, the contract well, think about the guys, the guys currently playing for the main Celtics. I even would, would kill for five years. It's <laughs> true. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, no, when I say horrendous, I don't mean in like, I, I mean, in, in his favor <laughs> like he is not no I, I got it yeah yeah no I Evan I think you you, you, you hit the nail on the head I, I I think that's exactly what these guys think and even when it is a situation where they get if Peterson's with Boston on a on a road trip or even just sits on the bench for a home game and he's just there as an extra body and there are games where these guys will go and it's an off night in Maine and the team's at home on a home stand and they've got a night off and Boston's at, at the garden and they're not uh, even if they're not playing and they're in street clothes, it's a chance for them to pick these guys' brains. And it, Hauser's the Hauser came back up for a game. He is like, he is so. I think he you even seen some of the video footage that's come out the last couple of days where you got how Cornette was wearing a main jersey in warmups uh, the other night. I think it was against I forget who they were playing Boston at home. Um, but they do pick these guys' brains, and and Hauser and Cornette are two excellent examples of this because they are they are playing, they are actually playing Hauser more regularly than Cornette. Cornette's almost like a, he's it's like a spot starter in baseball, right? They'll give him a spot start or a spot backup role when Horford's out on the second night of a back to back, or Tillman's uh, wasn't quite ready yet getting involved with the team. Porzingis, the nights they manage him. It's exactly what they, that runs through their mind. And I think they think of it also like, oh, you know, it's not just Boston. Like, this is what the league's turned into yeah. uh, for, for a guy like a Peterson or a Wieskamp or even a guy like uh, Walsh, who, who's who got a more, little bit more raw ability um, across the board, not just to be a role guy, but maybe in the NBA with a, a lesser NBA team and, and play more. But that's the give right. and take of what being part of the, the Celtics is. 
Well, it's to that point, exactly. Guys are not at this level. I mean, what I feel like most people know this. I think it's kind of common sense, but you know, there, there's no like organizational loyalty. Like guys in Maine no. are not thinking about how do I get to Boston? They're thinking Correct. about how do I get to the NBA? How Correct. do I get to an opportunity that exists for me with the anyone in the association? They don't care about the Celtics. In fact, they look at it and say, I'm going to get my opportunity here in Maine and, and take advantage of it as best I can. I can see there's no opportunity. There's no room for me in the roster in Maine or in Boston. But so long as I make an impact down here, somebody's going to come calling. And so that's that's the objective. While you're here, Glash, and I don't want to go too long with this show, but I want to mix in a little bit of NBA. You don't just talk G League, obviously. You, you know what's going on in the association. Uh, you know, we're talking about the playoff seating and the jockeying for position. I just want to point out, because I just noticed this, it's not at all relevant to Boston, but I just think it's funny. So in the Western Conference, where... I mean, that is is very much in flux right now. I mean, Minnesota and Denver are still tied for the top seed. Oklahoma City only a game back. You have the Clippers, Maver <laughs> Mavericks, Pelicans, Suns, pardon me, all separated by just a few games. Kings, Lakers, Warriors, you know, it, we, we know who's, everyone else below them has been eliminated. So one through 10, we know. We just don't know what the order obviously is going to be. And so it makes yeah. a play-in tournament, uh, you know, unpredictable and funny and you know like could we see the lakers and warriors play against each other in the play-in tournament if the season ended today they exactly didn't they do that a couple of years ago that happened a couple of years ago right, right. so it's, it's yeah. just nuts with that kind of star power but what i wanted to point out was minnesota denver okc clippers mavericks pelicans in that order that is your one through six that is the current playoff bracket in the western conference and all of those teams just to it's a little fluky, I realize, but just to highlight, you know, these teams going for it right now, trying to lock in whatever specific seed, these teams are all riding winning streaks, all of them, all six. It's it's just kind of nuts, you know, not not as much so in the uh, in the East or even among the play-in teams. But the Eastern Conference, which obviously people care more about, we know the Celtics are uh, firmly locked into their spot as the top team, not only in the East, but in the NBA and by a wide margin. And then the Bucks are the only other team guys that have clinched a playoff spot in the East. The Knicks, the Magic, the Cavs, the Pacers, the Sixers, the Heat, all right now are separated by three games. Yeah. Three through eight separated by three games. So any of them could be playoff teams or could be play-in tournament teams. The Bulls mm -hmm. and the Hawks are locked in, however, in 9 and 10, in whichever the order winds up being. So we know they are playing in the play-in tournament against each other. But everybody else, you know, it's it's TBD. And we have had injuries, load management, whatever, all over the place. The East is just, it's thinning out. I mean, I, I don't want to say this is an easy road for Boston. I, you know, weird things happen. So I, I and injuries happen, as is happening elsewhere. So I take nothing for granted. But right now, if you are the Boston Celtics, and if you are healthy, you have to feel good about what's happening around you in the East and and the potential inevitability of a, show, a showdown with, you know, Jokic and the Nuggets on the other side in the NBA Finals. It's what people want. I mean, maybe people don't want to face Denver because that's scary as hell. But it's what, you know, the NBA, I'm sure, would love to see. And I, what do you make of what you've seen so far? Not so far, but what, what exists right now in the Eastern standings and whether is there a team glass that you look at and just say, all right, that's the biggest threat to Boston, especially when you now consider the injury to Giannis. I'm sure. You guys have done this before, like Miami, right? You can't rule out Miami. Yeah. But that's, but, but can you, or can't you like, it's, you can't, you can't rule out Miami because of PTSD, but if you remove that, can you rule out Miami? No, I, I think they're good. I think they've got, They've got enough. They got enough there to make it. I'm not saying that they're gonna stomp all over the Celtics and do it to them Buck style. It could happen to the Bucks. A couple. But I, here I am. I say that, and they had a 3-0 lead in last year's conference finals. Um, mm -hmm. I respect Spolstra. I respect uh, Butler, and not just Butler, but what Butler has injected into uh, that well, team in their belief. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like it's got a. I like how Evan brought up the Max Struess example. Like they, they can just plug and play dudes in there and they think, oh, look, Max Struess did that or Caleb Martin did that. And then give another guy a shot. And like Terry Rozier gets a chance at some redemption on a, on a contending team. Mm -hmm. um, Cleveland, I thought uh, going back to last year, I know Boston played them back in December and took a 
two game home series away from them on a Tuesday and Thursday, I think. But Donovan Mitchell, I don't know if he wants to be there. Uh, seem like it. Damian Lillard's had some stuff. I think SI had an article on him and he feels lonely. Like that's kind of a if the fact that Giannis has won one, and I know Doc's won one uh back from 08, but does that Bucks team have any shot to be like the I can't I think it was the year of the lock, not the lockout, but the shortened season where the Celtics were with Garnett, Pierce, and Allen. They were like hovering around 500. Then they got in, got a good draw. I think Philly had an injury or something at the top of the league when they had Iguodala and the Celtics went all the way to the conference final. I, I don't know if it was the year they went to the finals uh in 2000, uh, 2010. But anyway, like do the Bucks have that in them? Because they have won it before. At least Giannis has, Lopez, uh, Middleton. Bobby Portis, like I, yeah, they've got guys who've done. I'm re, I'm reaching, I'm reaching. Uh, to answer your question, um, Orlando's got nothing to lose. I think that's a great year for them, and some of the the length they have along their front line can be mm-hmm. problematic. I'm curious to see how Porzingis looks in a playoff series and playing every night and game planning against the same team. Um, I'm not too worried about Tatum from just from this standpoint of like game planning for the same team every night in a playoff series. The only guy I really haven't seen do that is Porzingis because he hasn't been on many winning teams. Yeah, I think I guess he won some games when he was in Dallas, but uh, Miami, I don't worry about Philly all that too, uh, all that much because I don't think it's going to be. Uh, I think Embiid, his style of play is great for the regular season, but I don't know if it exactly translates. However, I do like Nick Nurse as a coach. Um, and Nick Nurse. Fun fact, was a G League coach in the Raptors organization and worked his way up. And he's uh, he plays his guys a lot of minutes. Um, it's got like a Thibodeau feel to him, but uh, they play hard every night. And I think they're they're maximizing what that roster is with the Tobias Harris contract and whatnot. So, and the Knicks, uh, Jalen Brunson's a good story. The Villanova guys they've they've put together. They they've got a culture, but I don't think talent wise they're there. They almost remind me of it and the Celtics like Brunson's just having this unreal season and they're just riding his coattails and we'll see how far he takes us kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, you get my, I mean, you get Miami, if Miami ends up being the, because Miami could win in Philly, right. And be the seven and they could get Milwaukee in the first round and you, you dodge them in the first round. But if, if you draw Miami, I, I know you mentioned PTSD, but that's, well, I could also see them, I could see them knocking off the Bucks again without a yeah, doubt. That too. I mean, if if Giannis isn't available or just isn't remotely a hundred percent, I mean, I, I wouldn't assume any sort of success from the Bucks. I mean, when he before the injury, they haven't been any good, and you know, basically since Doc took over. I know, and Adebayo to me, I thought Adebayo was fantastic in the bubble year that they went to the finals against, but he hasn't at least against the Celtics out of bio hasn't been really an issue, right? It's been Butler and shooters it's right. been Butler and spacing and kicking it to guys. And so I, my, was a problem. yeah, in the Eastern conference finals and they played him in the bubble band was a huge problem. Yeah, it was, it was excellent. And then I think the Celtics found a, they, they made an adjustment or maybe out of bio is not as good as I think. Well, he's Rob, a great Rob, having Rob Williams has been, a, was a huge help. And then now yeah. having poor Zingas is a whole different, like, Rob could hang with with Bam in terms of all the stuff that Bam likes to do. Um, you know, he takes away Bam as a lob threat. If they didn't have Rob, the, I could just have PTSD of watching all these alley oops uh, to 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 Bam because they didn't have any rim protection without Rob Williams. And you know, they have Rob, but you know, it it makes life easier in certain regards. And then you know, but Bam is a hell of a defensive player, can roam all around. What's interesting about this version of the Celtics is they're able to. Um, kind of reel in what Bam can do as a defensive playmaker. Bam just wreaks havoc as a guy that can just float around. And because Porzingis is a a, a capable three-point shooter, he's got to follow Porzingis out of the three-point line. That's what, to me, is going to be really interesting if they play Miami. What does Spo come up with? What junk zone does Spo throw out there to as a latch? Because, like, we – like. I, it wouldn't shock me if Miami were to win the series, but it would have to be with some junk zone that I've never even seen before. Like he'd have to come up with something really unique. And and I, I think the world of Spo, I think Nick nurse is a similar, like cut of a similar cloth of we're going to be prepared for everything, whatever mm-hmm. defense we play, we've run it in practice in games, no matter what we do, we have confidence in it. Just Spo's team seem to be just slightly better at executing those things uh, throughout a seven game series. 
And I'm just curious to do with Bam. And then, like, what guy on Miami just goes crazy? Because you know some yeah. guy is going to come off the bench. Like, like it's like, it's just going to be like Highsmith, right? Haywood Highsmith is going to come off the bench and shoot 42% from three on seven attempts a game and bury them like Caleb Martin did last year. Then they'll make the finals, and you won't hear from that guy ever again. Like, it's just, like, the yeah. most annoying thing in the history yeah. of, of basketball. Yeah, so, Koff, before you jump back in to echo Evan's point, I think that's, that's a good call out because I think Porzingis uh, – he, the Celtics have not in the last five, six years, they haven't had a guy like this who can stretch the floor. You're going to have to work hard on both ends against mm-hmm. Porzingis. And I think he's been a very, I, w- I don't want to say a surprise, but I think we've found out he's, he's an, actually a, an above average defender. Um, and he, he does present matchup problems on the defensive end, but offensively the way he stretches the floor, they haven't had that piece. Whereas I'm talking more about the opponent now. The opponent has to actually work really hard now to come out and guard a big that can shoot. So you're in beads, Giannis, Adebayo, um, and even the guys in Orlando, Cleveland. Cleveland's got Mobley back, and Jared Allen's had a fine year. Um, that's a no, that's a different dynamic than previous three pointers. If you let them, yeah, or yeah, or you just let them do it, and that could yeah. be troublesome. But no, I mean, it, we, look, we've been talking about this in recent weeks, and, and I'm sure you have. Because what else? You, what that? What else are you going to talk about? They've had the East locked up. I get it. Well, I get it. Well, not not even just that. I mean, the fact that you know, especially now that year one is just about in the books in terms of the regular season. You know, Porzingis has absolutely exceeded my expectations, and I, you know, came into the year with a a reasonable bar for him. Uh, so, but he is still he's cleared it. He's you know he's been everything i i think they were targeting and more so far it's but it's the other sort of side of that coin and you know ev, ev and i we get into this uh, a lot with our our buddy seth on on our group thread uh, it's it's never been about the regular season it's been about the playoffs yeah. and you know what is the impact going to be there and can he handle the physicality of it the grind of it be reliable to be on the floor all of these things and and that's not i don't bring these up these things up to imply that he can't or won't be an unknown. Shape. It's just we don't know it. You know, we we haven't seen it before. Never mind in Boston. Period. We really haven't seen it before. And a lot of these guys, and this is a credit to the Celtics, most of them, the impactful ones, have have been through it. They've been through the ringer. I mean, there's there's no more. And honestly, in my mind, this went away a couple of years ago anyway. But there's no more like pointing at the Jays and saying they're inexperienced or they're too young or they're yeah. like, no, you're there. It's your moment. You know, you fail, you fail, but there's, there's, there's no built-in excuse anywhere. And we've now lost the, you know, I never had this or I never played this card because I never believed in it. But for the rate, the many, many people, the maybe 50% of people that scream throughout Marcus Smart's career of, of what a, you know, negative force that he was on this team, you know, at least on the floor, if not off. And again, Marcus, if you're out there listening, I don't buy it. There, we, don't, we don't, we don't stand you. Uh, we, we we're big fans here of Marcus smart, but I'll, I'll tell you what, I mean, there are a lot of people that would point to the, the smart excuse and you know, that's gone too. All, you know, Joe, it's not his first year anymore. He's been a damn good coach. He's going to be in the coach of the year conversation. The excuses are gone. Like everybody, Horford obviously has had many deep playoff runs with this team and elsewhere. You know, you've had White, you know, knows what it takes. Pritchard, you know, Hauser is is maybe for the first time going to get a real opportunity. I mean, he hasn't, I, I guess if you want to point to him and say he hasn't really had it. I wish he had last year. I was begging for him to get it last year, and he really didn't. So this is now Hauser's time. But but Porzingis is something of I don't want to call him an X factor that, that that's, that's too much, but there's, there's definitely, you know, now his time has come to show that he's who everyone has come to believe that he is. And I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm not yeah. going in with skepticism or doubt. I'm just excited to see it. And I, I know that we're all just to kind of put a nice little bow on this from where we started. I'm excited to get through these next through game three games. Cause that's, that's where we're at now. You know, I, I, I've often said, like, enjoy the ride, don't wish time away, all that. Now we're in the get-through portion. Get through the last three games of the regular season that don't mean anything, and let's get to the playoffs and find out who they're facing and, you know, shorten the benches and you get the more predictable rotations and minutes and all that good stuff that, you know, I love from a DFS and gambling perspective. And this is just going to be fun. I hope it's fun, but we need them to stay healthy. And that's yeah. that's ultimately the bottom line. Maintain your depth that comes through health. Last thing, last thing I'll say is, um, 
I'm sure you've heard this before. You guys have talked about this, I'm sure, on your shows and other Celtics content you consume. So you asked me what team? Well, it's them, It's themselves, right? They, the only team they can get in their own way is themselves. And if I'm sorry, when you play a seven-game series, whether it's round one, whether it's the conference final, and more specifically, if it's an NBA final, they've had an excellent point differential, just over 11 points a game. I don't. There's going to be a couple games in a seven-game series. If a, if a series goes six, there might only be two. There might be one. There might be three. There could be four. I just hope they stay the same and that same connectivity on offense and keep running their stuff and, and go away from it at the end of these games. And I, the Porzingis thing, I, I was working at the sports hub the night this happened, but they went to Porzingis a ton in one of those games. He had 15 shots at halftime and he took two in the fourth quarter and overtime combined in that second Atlanta game. And I'm like, now I liked the play they ran for him. They threw it into him in the post, drew a second defender, and then they had Brown come off a curl and he hit the tough contested elbow jumper. But like, that's a kind of play where I'm like, okay, that's good. They're still using the dude they went out and got to change the spacing and give, uh, that's where like the Marcus Smart thing, I'm like, okay, like, you're right. That's gone. If you had problems with it, that's gone. Um, keep, use everybody like you don't have to just say give it a zero get out of the way or give it a seven get out of the way keep playing your game um because these games will get tight that is par for the course that's how that's how a series goes especially against a respectable opponent like a i don't love the sixers but they have seen you before i respect nurse they've got guys that have been there before uh whether they've won a lot is a different question but they've been in the playoffs before your Miamis, your Milwaukee's, like you got to stay in it and just don't go away from stuff at the end because it's close and you're supposed to clear out and try to make a crazy shot to win a game. Like keep playing your game. That's okay. right. That's what I would get worried about. So that's what I mean when I say beat yourselves. Like keep doing what you've been doing for three and a half quarters. I don't respect Philly at all. If you lose to Philly, yeah. blow it up. Oh, I don't. Blow it up yeah. and start over if you lose to the Sixers. Well, I'll tell you, the, the team, everybody. the staff is going to tell them to respect them. And respect yes. and be like oh, yeah. I'm yeah, doing no, the coach I, look, thing. I, yeah. I want I want the Celtics to, you know, respect the Oklahoma City blue. Like that's I, I, <laughs> I want nothing but respect from them. Yeah. I don't need to respect them. That I have no impact on on the way this plays out. But uh, glad I think one of the more, one of the more it's just to your point, like if they get Miami, like one of the more underrated things about this team the last half decade. They smoke. Well, they didn't smoke them, but think of the, remember the Nets series when they had to play Durant and Irving, and it, everyone's like, "Oh no, they got to get the Nets in the first round." How worried are you? Are they are they up for it? Do you like this draw? And they swept no, them. I'll tell you what, that's that's about as closely contested a sweep as you'll ever see. Exactly. I feel like, I feel like the Celtics won that series by a total of like ten points. I. But that's my point. Like th- th- no one gave the Nets a shot. They're disgruntled you've got two stars they kind of they, they they met in the they met in the the tunnel going back a few years at all-star weekend let's put it together and right. that's why it wouldn't count out like a milwaukee that's had its issues i'm sure but you you might get into some grinders here and you gotta stay together and that's a that's a great example of a marcus smart game where he made a great cut and made a great finish and mm-hmm. i'm with you too on tatum like game six milwaukee the year they went to the finals S- philadelphia last year like he's he's had some moments where he's had to not just the end of the game, one specific possession, but put together a quarter, put together a half. Yeah, th- th- those uh, those excuses are yes, out out the window. But use the pieces you went out and got because they're you got a champion in Holiday. Porzingis is a complimentary piece on a title team, I think. Um, so yeah. Anyway, that's that's all I got. And then uh, I think the main Celtics are going to win the championship. I think Thursday night. That's how I'll wrap it on my end. See that, but before the you know before the big clubs championship push begins, we we got a, a championship to crown still in the G League here. The main Celtics, the Oklahoma City Blue, Thursday night. Glass should be on the radio broadcast. Are you uh, where? Where can the people find you if they want to? Listen I don't know. So I think our our mutual friend Evans Boston is going to have the. Uh... The Comrex and he'll be out there because he's he's also our director of public. I know. Well, you know, it's G, it's a G League budget, man. They can't uh, send us they out gotta, there. They got to travel you out there. I, mean, uh, I, hey. I love I love Evans. I do. But hey. I mean, Evans Boston. Ev- Evans called the national championship for Syracuse back in 03. I was just going to go there. He, he was on the call for that one. Now he's going to get to call this. Well, now I'm going to now I'm now I'm even more curious to listen. <laughs> Yeah, I want, so he's gonna be all selfishly, sorts. selfishly, if they don't get it done Thursday, we would have game three, the deciding game three. It's a best of three series would be yeah. 
Monday night at nine Eastern uh, at the expo. So well, cool as it would be to win at home, you know, no, nobody wants the pressure of a winner take no. all game. No. You know, go, go out, get the job done, especially when you're up, like you said, 28 in, in the first half, you beat the team by 20, just go out, torch this club, win the title. And let's, let's have a, I don't, I don't know. What's, what's the equivalent of a duck boat parade through Portland. <laughs> I mean, we're I don't going, know. They're going on a, on a brewery tour. That's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. A lobster tasting. There yeah, go. there we go. I love it. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. For Brendan Glasheen, great to have him on. It's been a while. For Evan Valenti, I am Adam Kaufman. Next time, it is a preview of the playoffs and what is to come for the Boston Celtics in round one. Very excited. It's almost here, folks. We're into mid-April at this point. Playoffs are coming, and hopefully a parade is only a couple months behind. We'll talk soon.